the last um, speaker, she also my instructor on the training course as well. Uh, she is Dr. Catherine Patterson. She worked in uh, foreign affairs specialist in NOAA Office of Law Enforcement. Uh, Dr. Patterson studied on marine biologists in the topic of the coral reef, uh, marine protected area, ecosystem management, sustainable fishery and marine tourism. Uh, she got PhD in environmental science and public policy. Very good one. And her work on at the NOAA ORE focus on combating IUU through the management and enforcement effort, international engagement and technical and capacity building assistance. And uh, she also lead the development of NOAA ORE domestic and international port state major inspector training program. Anyone who interests on the training course of the inspector, this is the time for your information. Her presentation today entitled NOAA's support for Southeast Asia to combating IUU fishing. Uh, Dr. Catherine Patterson, you are at up. Thank you. Let me just um, share my slides. Are my slides okay? Okay, thank you. Sawadika, salamat pagi, and good morning, good evening, and good afternoon to all of our colleagues, both in the region and around the world. Um, I saw many familiar faces in the participant, li participant list. So I'm very excited to see you all here on the call today. So just a little bit of background for those that are not familiar with the NOAA's Office of Law Enforcement specifically. We are the only civilian law enforcement agency in the United States focused on the enforcement of marine resources. So we work closely with our Coast Guard brethren for combating IU fishing due to our delegated authorities and roles. And we are the lead implementers of the United States Port State Measures Agreement implementation. So we've heard a lot about international collaboration and our agency collaboration and the need to have effective action and take effective actions against combating off IU fishing and not just have discussions. And that's something that's also gonna be emphasized through this presentation as a continued theme throughout this workshop. So thanks to Natalie and yesterday, Matthew Camilleri with the FAO. I hope everybody has some familiarity with the Port, ba Port State Measures Agreement. It entered into force in 2016 after 29 parties, including the European Union ratified the agreement. Currently there are 66 parties. So at this point, we're at a place where over half of the coastal nations in the world have joined the agreement. So as Matthew said yesterday, the Port State Measures Agreement has had one of the highest accession rates of any FAO agreement that has been, um, that is legally binding. So the importance of the Port State Measures Agreement is that it is the only international treaty dedicated to combating IU fishing. Now, many of us, especially the fisheries inspectors and the law enforcement types and other authorized law enforcement personnel on this workshop today are very aware that we were all combating IU fishing before IU fishing became kind of a buzzword and before the PSMA agreement entered force. So in many cases, partner countries are already doing a great deal of the work. And as we'll talk about what our capacity building and technical assistance includes, we'll walk through those steps. But I do wanna highlight and take this moment to, to emphasize the fact that the Port State Measures Agreement is just one tool and a very important tool, but just a tool to combat IU fishing. We all still need to have strong and effective MCS measures, monitoring control and surveillance measures in place in addition to implementing tools like the Port State Measures Agreement and some of the other tools that we have discussed in the previous presentation. So having a holistic approach to monitoring control and surveillance is also key. Why the Port State Measures Agreement? I feel Natalie covered this very well in her presentation, but just to reemphasize, 
all IU fish or all fisheries products have to come to land eventually in order to be a beneficial economic value. It doesn't do much good for the fish to be maintained on board and be floating around the sea. So the Port State Measures Agreement does focus on dockside and conducting port inspections and most importantly, full audit of the catch being offloaded. And this is where all of the pieces come together in terms of closing loopholes to IU fishers as we all work together to close the available ports for IU fishers to enter and fishing related activities. So we've heard a lot about information sharing this week. And in addition, I wanted to highlight a key, some key messages about the Port State Measures Agreement. Now, why am I focusing on the Port State Measures Agreement? A lot of our technical assistance and capacity building projects were focused on broader combating IU fishing efforts and how to develop MCS systems, how to develop fisheries enforcement units from the ground up. What do you need to have in place in terms of legal authorities, uh, inspector needs, training needs in order to be able to combat IU fishing. Over the last couple of years, a lot of our requests have transitioned into receiving specific requests for inspector training or operational training for managers in order to implement this agreement. And so that is one of the reasons why we're focusing so much on the PSMA today. And I just wanted to highlight that. So as we'll see, we wanna keep the broad context as well. So the PSMA doesn't just envision information sharing as a component of the agreement, it mandates it. And this is a key point because true IU fishing operators and fishing related operators, it, they rely on us not speaking to each other. They rely different agencies or ministries not speaking to each other. They rely on different ports within a nation not speaking together. So ensuring that if an inspector goes on board, conducts his or her inspection, that that inspection report doesn't just go into a drawer in an office somewhere. To have this need for national international share information sharing within a country, interagency, interagency information sharing, regional and global. So one of the key strengths of the Port State Measures Agreement, and there are many, is the mandate to, infor to share information. So in many aspects where there's a decision point involved in the agreement, for example, denying port entry to a vessel, denying port services or the use of ports to a, a foreign flag fishing or fishing support vessel, or taking law enforcement action or detecting violations of IU fishing. These all require communicating with the flag state, mandated, and as relevant and appropriate other coastal states regional organizations, uh, Mr. Orr referenced in, in the RPOA, IUU referenced the um, F Interpol Fisheries Crime Working Group who has played an important role in the seizure of many of the Camelar IU known vessels, as well as the IMCS network, other regional fisheries management organizations, as well as the FAO. And then having global information sharing. So yesterday the FAO mentioned the global information exchange system that's being developed and all of these tools are going to help us have better access to what actions are be ta being taken across the globe. So for us in the United States, we're very lucky to have strong enforcement partners in your regions for fisheries and can get these alerts. We're also an observer to the RPOA IUU. But in many cases, it's, it's hard to know if a vessel has been denied entry in one country and then it's transited into your area. So this is the idea behind this international global sh information sharing. The more data we all have, and not just on the suspect IU fishing vessels and not just on the known IU fishing vessels, but also knowing which vessels are compliant is truly important when we're talking about conducting effective risk assessments and being able to prioritize inspections and screen vessels for 
suspicion of IU phishing. So as we all work globally to implement the Port State Measures Agreement and share information, these are all key points that are just going to make the ocean smaller and smaller and smaller for the known IU phishing operators. For the maritime domain awareness personnel on the call, there, I think it's important for you to know that under the Port State Measures Agreement, port states are required to collect a lot of information relevant to vessel ownership, as well as just vessel identification. And this information that is collected both through a prior notice of arrival, as well as through the inspection itself, is also incredibly important from a maritime domain awareness and maritime security perspective. So it's not just the fisheries units, it's the navies, the coast guards, the defense forces, it's customs, it's all of us working together within our own respective authorities. <laughs> Excuse me. So not to reiterate this too hard, but it's all about information sharing. This is how we're truly going to be successful in the event, in the fight against IU fishing. And being sensitive to that fact that Southeast Asia receives a lot of carrier or reefer or transshipment vessels, depending on where you're calling in from, they might be termed differently. These vessels are incredibly hard to conduct the necessary information analysis needed into all of the donor vessels that have transshipped at sea product on board. And it's very laborious, it's very time consuming, and it's not a very quick check. And so in terms of the Southeast and Asian context, we're very empathetic that this is a strong workload, especially for those in Vietnam and Thailand and other areas where you're receiving the vast majority of your PSMA vessels subject to the Port State Measures Agreement are in fact carrier vessels. So as more countries strengthen their port state controls, as well as their port state measures alike, there is evidence that at sea transshipments are increasing, um, both legally and illegally, as a way to circumvent the Port State Measures Agreement. So as this workshop focuses on next steps, that is one area that all of us in the, in the global community, community are very aware of and keeping our eyes on, but it does make the fisheries inspectors jobs at the docks conducting these inspections that much harder in the absence of information. And this is another right reason why it takes all of us working together in order to get the harvest or donor vessel information, information on whether or not there's any electronic transmissions from the vessel during the transshipment activities through the RFMOs, through other tools that allow you to have the access if the vessels are not dark and things of that nature. So with that, we focus on this a great deal in terms of information analysis, risk assessment, and the screening of vessels in our Port State Measures Agreement training program that I'm going to speak of next. So as an implementer of the agreement, the United States NOAA Office of Law Enforcement developed a training that specifically focuses on the operational requirements of the agreement. Now, I have put summaries of this, of our different types of training programs on the slides, and I'm happy to follow up with more information. We have course syllabi for each of our training modules. We have a list of our training modules, and we have a lot more information that I can share to interested parties. But, and additionally, there are a lot of fantastic resources out there from NGOs, our partners at FAO, on what it is a party needs to be able to implement the Port State Measures Agreement. But when NOAA was developing this training program, we had observed a great gap in the how to implement components. So there's many resources, there's many checklists, there's many guides telling you what you need to have in place, but there weren't a lot of training programs that actually walked step by step through each operational requirement and provided best practices on the how to do each of the operational requirements. So this is really where our niche is and our focus. And of course, NOAA is not unique in this aspect. We're working with our partners in Australia, New Zealand, 
the European Fishery, or Fisheries Control Agency, Canada, and others around the world where we have moved into training or trainer phases to ensure that all of those delivering these trainings are doing them with similar approaches and that there's harmonization in what is being delivered. So we include both our fisheries inspectors in these training programs, as well as other authorized law enforcement personnel. Um, both Gary and Natalie hit this point very uh, correctly. It's not just the fisheries inspectors, it's typically your port authorities and harbor masters that are the ones actually communicating with the vessel to authorize and deny port services, or sorry, port entry, as well as port services. It could be your Coast Guard as the captain of the port. So it's not just the fisheries inspectors. We try to involve all agencies or ministries that have an operational role, primary operational role in the implementation of the agreement. We first developed this training by taking Annex A, uh, or sorry, excuse me, Annex E, of the Port State Measures Agreement, which is the guidelines for inspector training. And we created at least one training module per element, and there's 12 listed there. Due to the requests of our partners globally, we have increased our number of training manuals by many more. And so all this information I'm happy to make available, but what it's meant to be is an A to Z menu of training that partner countries can identify their priority needs, their pre-assessment process and through conversations so that we can make a training program that is unique to the specific needs of each of our partner countries. So every country we're working with, the training is a little bit different for these reasons. So you can basically select what is most relevant. Um, I do wanna highlight our work in Indonesia because this is what led to our development of our PSMA implementation workshop for high level officials. In many countries, we've actually had the fisheries inspectors request that we speak to their bosses and their bosses' bosses so that they can better understand the Port State Measures Agreement and what's being asked of the fisheries inspectors or enforcement personnel so that they can be better supported and equipped with the resources they need. So noting that this workshop is to focus on next steps and ways to move forward. I thought it would be best to summarize some of the key points that our training trainees have identified themselves. I saw several of you in the participant list, so feel free to add your own input and thoughts in the chat box as well. I would love to hear from you. And also I hope that you and your families are all staying safe and healthy in these uncertain times. But the primary thing that we see is legal authorities and ensuring that fisheries inspectors have the legal authorities that they need to implement the agreement. The agreement itself gives no port state any new additional legal authorities. These all come from national legislation. So with that, we also provide technical drafting assistance and have done so for many of our partners to ensure that the operational needs of the inspectors are included in those legal authorities and implementing regulations. Clear designation of roles and responsibilities for each ministry involved is also priority. So we've worked with several countries on developing standing, standard operating procedures based on their implementing regulations so that we can identify who does what and how and, for example, how does the vessel communicate the prior notice of arrival to the port state? How is that information received? Who is responsible for screening it? How is that information given to the fisheries inspector, most importantly, before they climb on board that vessel? Because from a safety and security purpose and our number one priority in law enforcement, it is crucial for that inspector to be equipped with the best information available and all knowledge that they possibly can prior to stepping foot on that vessel. So these are just some examples and what our trainers, our trainees have highlighted. Um, Interagency ministry communication plans. So that goes along with the standard operating procedures, making, ensuring there's efficient and sufficient information sharing across the ministries, which we've discussed. 
reference materials for instructors is a high demand item. Ensuring your inspectors have a regulation books on national regulations, but because the Port State Measures Agreement focuses a lot on what foreign flag vessels are doing on the high seas, I think all of us can agree that learning, truly learning the conservation and management measures of regional fisheries management organizations has been quite the learning curve, including for the United States. So with that in mind, we've created our FMO cheat sheets to better equip our inspectors to know what conservation management measures over these hundred page documents and compendiums do they need to be focused on from an IU fishing perspective? Translation materials, something as simple as having flashcards to just help and aid communications with the vessel master and crew that may or may not speak a common language with the inspectors themselves. So additionally, we also conduct counter IU fishing training programs and these are meant to be broader and they really focus on what we call the main six pillars needed for combating IU fishing. So these are your legal tools. Um, the use of fisheries intelligence and analysis is probably our highest request to date. And this is something that is that we focus on a great deal in both our PSMA inspector trainings as well as our counter IU fishing inspector trainings. Emerging technologies, conduct of the fisheries inspections, fishery investigation. So what's that next step? After the fisheries inspector gets off the vessel, how do we initiate investigations? How do we, as we like to say in our trainings, dig deeper? What's the next step? And I wanna hit on Gary's point a little bit too, um, successful prosecution of IU fishing cases. So in some cases with partner countries, their focus is on case package development for successful prosecution. So we work with the legal offices from that country and we'll actually have a mock trial at the very end as one of the main practical exercises. So all of this work would not be possible without the support and assistance from all of our partners and our funding partners and our collaborators. So I would like to just take this time to give a shout out to all those listed and the others that are not, and just highlight that the other types of technical assistance and capacity building um, training that we do offer that was not included previously. So it's not limited to our four curriculum. Everything is able to be applicable to a specific partner's needs. And so these are other topics that were also, and I would like to highlight counter marine wildlife trafficking. This is something that we originally did in the Philippines most recently um, and has waned in and out as IU fishing has become a priority, but this is a technical assistance request. We get a great deal and we work with our partners at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which many of you also do. So what are we doing in Southeast Asia? I am no means have the time to go through every single country, but what I wanted you all to get out of this is how different our work is in the various countries based on our partners' requests and the types of uh, technical assistance we're able to provide. Our goal is always to take things to a sustainable level. We just completed our first training of the trainers in Indonesia last fall, which was very excited. And I would like to highlight uh, Indonesia as a case study for our, what we envision our partnerships to look like. We've been working with the Ministry of Maritime Affairs and Fisheries in Indonesia since 2009. Um, they are in the process of actually adapting NOAA's curriculum for PSM inspector training into their national com competencies, and that will serve as the foundation for their inspector training moving forward. We provided technical drafting assistance for the regulations, um, and we are now in our standard operating procedure development phase. So we like to take a holistic approach to these partnerships. Oh, sorry. We've also conducted broader maritime law enforcement workshops. And this is important because combating naive fishing cannot be done alone. We need our police forces, we need our defense forces engaged. So I did wanna highlight that as we've done this work in Malaysia and recently in Thailand and Pattaya as well. And we also have upcoming work in Thailand and Vietnam 
scheduled after the pandemic has that is more under control. So with that, I would like to highlight, feel free to reach out to me personally. Here's my contact information. If you're interested in information analysis or have questions on specific vessels, you can reach out to our intelligence analyst team, who's that second email address. And then for any questions related to combating IU fishing or the port state measures agreement, you can email our international email address. And with that, I thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. And we also have a lot of fun doing our work as you can see in these photos. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, uh, for the uh, very good, very comprehensive activity that, that NOAA support to Southeast Asia region. Uh, we appreciate uh, your kind support, NOAA support. Um, seems to be our colleagues, uh, really, <laughs> pre, uh, uh, listen to your presentation, watch your presentation. Uh, no, no question come right now, but, but in SIFDEC, we, we appreciate your support. And I, a few time visit, join your training course. Uh, resource person from NOAA is very, very good and very com competent. Uh, right now, I think we, we don't have more question. Can I, uh, can I request for all speaker? Uh, we, we have one more round, one more round for before we end our webinar today, maybe you tonight. Uh, starting from, from Dr. Catherine, uh, we, we have a very short time, maybe one few, few minutes for, for wrap up. May I ask on behalf of SIPDEC, uh, from your perspective, from your work, uh, collaborate with our region, Southeast Asia region. Um, can you kindly provide the briefly suggestion, advice to us on the possible way forward, way forward uh, for activity or tool or approach that for combating IUU fishing in Southeast Asia? Uh, starting from Dr. Catherine. Yes, thank you for that question. I think for next steps, it's not just having the uh, joining agreements and RFMOs, it's the effective implementation piece. So, um, and, and the United States is still, to be quite honest, working on our implementation, one piece of our implementation as well. So because the poor state measures agreement is so new, we're all in this together. And I just wanna highlight that whether or not you're a party or non-party to the agreement, at the very basis of the Port State Measures Agreement, what it highlights is best practices for fisheries enforcement. And there are strong resources in the annexes, such as Annex B, for conducting inspections. So if countries are looking for protocols or standard operating procedures, procedures on how to conduct inspections, there are, there's a lot of resource information in the agreement itself. So I think all of us working together to effectively implement the agreement. I think the STS 50 case that the RPOA IUU Secretariat highlighted and the need for multinational engagement on investigations. There has been a great effort made by Interpol Fisheries Crime Working Group and RPOA IUU and others to bring all of the countries involved in investigations. And I think that's been highly successful because it does take all of our different pieces to be able to go after what uh, Gary was talking about and get to the beneficial ownerships because that's who we really wanna target. Having all of the tools in the toolbox is important, both civil and administrative penalties as well as criminal. And this was greatly highlighted in the Spanish Vidal case where um, as many on this call, I'm sure are aware of Vidal was a known IU fishing operator from the Camelar area. And the Supreme Court actually threw out the criminal case against Vidal, the Spanish Supreme Court. So if there had been no civil suits made against him, he would have gone away free. So 
ensuring that we have multiple tools to combat IE phishing, not just criminal, both civil and criminal, ensuring that we are focusing on effective implementation. Um, the, the focus of the Port State Measures Agreement is parties and port states get to identify which ports those vessels go to. Having stronger flag state responsibilities, ensuring that vessels are, that domestic vessels and national fleets have registries, that there is more um, control over domestic vessels for, for many partners. And then lastly, the focus, I think, as we're, unfortunately, Kofi had to be postponed this year, but as we would have seen at the FAO Committee on Fisheries meeting, keeping an eye on transshipment and working through RFMOs and other avenues to strengthen monitoring control and surveillance on RFMOs would be the top highlights that I would raise. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very excellent uh, suggestion and, and summarize uh, way forward for, for Southeast Asia region. Thank you, Dr. Catherine. May, may I move to our colleagues from uh, International MCS Network, uh, Gary. Uh, Gary, are you with us, sir? I am. I am. Okay, Gary, we, we, we come to the, the, the last sessions and we need your suggestion on the, the, the way forward for activity and tool from your perspective, from your work, from your experience, uh, way forward of the two to combating IUU in Southeast Asia. Can, can you kindly provide suggestions, sir? Yeah, uh, look, Catherine has is, is very kindly uh, stolen the show and listed almost everything I, I had uh, thought I might uh, reference in this conversation. But uh, I think the key thing is a layered approach, uh, as, as she rightly said. It's not just one tool will fix everything. You have to bring the full suite of MCS tools to bear uh, to address IEU. You, you have IEU within your domestic environment, you have it within your regional environment. Um, you know, fish don't respect boundaries, neither do the practitioners of IEU. And they will move between uh, territorial seas, uh, exclusive economic zones, they will move between RFMOs. One of the uh, significant challenges we found uh, during the Southern Ocean IUU operation was uh, vessels carrying multiple identities. Um, they were carrying multiple flags. One vessel, I believe, uh, when Indonesia inspected the vessel, had the flags for 50 different nations in the flag locker. Um, they have documentation that is uh, fraudulent. The, the information sharing um, that we did through that operation was by contacting those countries, uh, flag states that were continuously being having their their vessel registry abused by these illegal operators was by contacting them and saying, please give us an example of what a legitimate uh, vessel registration document is so that when we do boarding and inspection, we know how to detect fraudulent documentation. Um, we also worked with a number of countries that had third party uh, vessel registries and they'd handed over control of their vessel registry to a, a corporate organization. We encouraged those countries to bring control of their vessel registry back in uh, under their national authority and that then enables them to have greater control over well, what do we license vessels for. We found uh, from countries like Togo, uh, who had a number of vessels claiming to be flagged to Togo, they said, we do not license any vessel to go outside of our EEZ. So if you encounter a fishing vessel on the high seas or in anybody else's zone claiming to have the flag of Togo, it is fraud. So that made life a lot easier. And that's the simple sort of information sharing that can happen. A lot of it um, is down to having appropriate systems and processes in place for the sharing of information that can then be used in a legal jurisdiction. And that's where Port State Measures Agreement is so incredibly useful. And likewise for things like we have in the Pacific with um, 
the NUA Treaty Subsidiary Agreement. It allows us to move that information around rather than uh, relying on international treaties like the Mutual Assistance in Criminal Matters, which is quite a slow and cumbersome process for sharing information. Um, because IEU operators don't recognise borders, fisheries authorities, MCS enforcement officers need to be able to work across those very borders that restrict us in terms of who has jurisdiction. Um, with the Southern Ocean vessels, New Zealand never had jurisdiction over any of those vessels, but we worked with, I think, about 26 different countries to ensure that uh, that fleet was all but eliminated. There's still maybe one or two to go, but we haven't given up yet. And um, there was fantastic cooperation from uh, Asian countries, uh, from uh, our partners in the US and Canada and Spain, uh, particularly Spain. That was a really good example. We had worked with Spain for many years to try and get them to take responsibility for their nationals. They didn't have the legislation, domestic legislation, that enabled that to happen. They had a change of government, they had new legislation introduced, and then they were able to uh, tackle the problem, and they did that with a great deal of enthusiasm. Um, as Catherine rightly said though, um, the criminal prosecution failed because the High Court uh, decided that you can't uh, commit a crime on the high seas, a fisheries crime on the high seas, uh, so they had to rely on their um, administrative penalty regime, which was work, worked very successfully. So a layered approach, communication, uh, strong arrangements for sharing of information that can be used in a law and in a judicial uh, setting so it's admissible evidence so that when you do catch these people you can get convictions. Thank you Gary, really very constructive suggestion sir and uh, may, may I uh, shift the microphone to the speaker Natalie from from your perspective, you are work with the, the system, work with the high technology. Do you have any suggestion for this region, so it's a region on the combating IUU, madam? Thank you. Yeah, I think um, just to echo what Gary and Catherine have said, the key really is collaboration. We could not have made the innovations that we have um, and the successes that we have without partnering um, with governments, with industry, with other NGOs, with academia, really pooling together on our own areas of expertise and leveraging that has what is what has created uh, the, the success that we've had. And I also think it's worth noting the importance of the private sector and the seafood industry. And um, one of the main successes that we've had as well is being able to leverage on their buying power, the purchasing power, so that then um, if IEU is identified, there's a secondary step, or if even just risks, just suspicions are identified, there's a secondary step that they can utilize to not purchase the fish. So if it does get past um, port inspections, there's a secondary check. And so, yeah, just collaborating, private, public and private partnerships um, and leveraging off each of our own areas of expertise as well is really about the, the success that we've achieved. So thank you very much to everyone and great presentations from all. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you very much for your, your valuable suggestion, valuable suggestion. Um, come to uh, the, last, the last speaker. Uh, but did it? Yes. Did it? it seems to be a billion of ton. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs> how can how can country, how can partner, how can organization support IU, uh, RPOA IUU to combat this problem? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be the last. So <laughs> not too much conclusion that I can say. Uh, because all the panelists uh, uh, really uh, give uh, the important point for us in combating IUU fishing, especially in our region in Southeast Asia. Uh, RPA IUU is on the view that 
many improvement have been uh, made by uh, Southeast Asia country in terms of the uh, develop uh, good uh, fisheries uh, management measure. Uh, for example, uh, most of the Southeast Asia country now has a national plan of action to combat IUU fishing. I think that's good uh, good point for us. But uh, we do believe that uh, there is four uh, four main point in combating IUU fishing. The first one the role of the flag state. So as a flag state, all country has a uh, responsibility to control their, their fleet. This is uh, important for us. Uh, and as a port state, we have an obligation to ensure that all the lending product is not from the IUU fishing. And uh, as the coastal state, we have of obligation to protect uh, our uh, coastal from any uh, illegal fishing activity. And don't forget the last, we should implement the market measure to limit, uh, to limit uh, the, the product of IUU uh, go to market. And, but to conduct all uh, the key issue that I really highlight that cooperation, collaboration is the key. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Padi Dick. Your, your suggestion, your uh, recommendation is quite valuable for this region, not only organization, but also the, the national, the uh, ASEAN member state also. And uh, I think we come to the end of the, the session for uh, today, the second day of the, the Tele Seminar. And tomorrow we have a very highlight, a very highlight Tele Seminar in Titan way forward for combating IUU fishing in Southeast Asia. Uh, tomorrow we will uh, solo presenting by Dr. Warwit, I think. Dr. Warwit will wrap up everything from the first day, second day, and show you tomorrow. Really highlight, don't miss it. And for our speaker today, if you have, if you don't have any uh, any business for tomorrow, I would like to request you to participate the tomorrow tele seminar. And but 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 I I am sorry for for um, uh, Catherine, you you the time is not uh, appropriate very much. Uh, up up to you if you have chance, please participate and provide suggestion during the, our wrap-up way forward. This is very important for our ASEAN member state. And today, today, I, on behalf of organizer, on behalf of SIPDEC, would like to appreciate, express our appreciate to all speaker uh, for a very comprehensive presentations. And our Secretary General here, uh, Madam Secretary General, do you have, do you want to say something, yeah. Madam? Yes. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Isra. Uh, on behalf of CEDEC, I would like to thank all of the speakers for the excellent presentation today. And uh, I'm looking forward to see you tomorrow afternoon, Thailand time. Sorry for the time zone different, but it's, you are very important during this time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much and goodbye. Sawadee kap.